taking place and our lecturer, Roy Corbett, uh, he is not only a researcher but is a pianist and author of a well-known book, book uh, Debussy in Proportions, and he will... Ah. Ah. Uh, we can take the me uh, metro uh, U1 line from uh, this station, from the station Taubstummengasse, direct uh, train to Schwedenplatz. So, uh, to explain more exactly uh, the station uh, of the U1 metro, you go out from this building on the left. And behind this building on the left, you will see the sign, the blue sign U1, or only the U, and you take there three, three stations up to the Schwedenplatz. When the Schwede, at the Schwedenplatz, you, you come out from the metro, you walk through a small bridge, turn to the left, and the, uh, behind the next corner, the first corner, you find the, the uh, the Collegium Hungaricum, where the, where the uh, uh, concerts will take place and, uh, and the exhibition will be opened. Thank you. And uh, uh, the girls and the reception desk uh, prepared a map uh, and uh, they can sh show you more exactly how to get there. For example, if one wants to take the metro at the, at the Karlsplatz, uh, he can, can take the U1 because there are crossing two metro lines. Uh, and uh, uh, from the Karlsplatz there are only two metro stations to the Schwedenplatz. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and uh, now I'm glad to announce the lecture of Roy Hobart, our guest from Great Britain, um, London and uh, the Royal Conservatory of Scotland, Glasgow. Uh, his theme, Symmetries Overt and Hidden in Musical Form, please. Uh, yeah. huh? Yes. Yeah. Is it making much difference? No. Yes. Can you enough? I will speak loudly. I have to. Uh, I think it is best if I speak in English today. I am delighted to be here, and it, it is one of my dreams always for music. I think, like the composers, I love music <coughs> to be interacting with science and the other arts. It, see, music is a wonderful science as well as an art. And <coughs> Maybe it is just my particular kind of curiosity, but when I hear a beautiful piece of music, when I'm playing it, I like to have a look at it, make a map of it, and see what is happening. And sometimes it is surprising what one finds. Um, <clears throat> so I thought I would look at some pieces of music that show very clear symmetry in their organization. In some cases, in a way that I think the composer meant us to hear, in some cases that I think it is buried. And I showed, well, I'm going to start with this. I'm quite shamelessly wearing a not very smart shirt today because my sister just came back from Japan and gave me this. And I thought it's perfect for, for the occasion. Um, uh, so starting with this, this picture has figured, it figured quite a bit in, in this book um, because this, it is a lovely example of symmetry in many ways. If one looks at that, you see how... Beautifully, it's organized proportionally. You, um, I don't need to tell you what this ratio is. <coughs> I think you all know what it is, the golden schnitt. Um, and even on, the, even on the vertical, what's it doing? Let's have a look at that. There it is. Yes, even on the vertical plane, this, the way it is beautifully symmetrically organized has something sort of, <coughs> or something organic to it, which explains a lot about that <coughs> ratio. Now, I'm going to move from there. Having shown you these, gold, did you notice my golden sections ran away? They didn't really want you to see them very much. Oh, they're fading away. Um, <laughs> because I'm not going to talk about that today. I want to talk about symmetry. And if you see any golden sections, you can get as excited as you like. But it's not my, <laughs> my real topic. Um, the, I want to start with the first of Debussy's preludes, uh, composed just at the beginning of 1910, Danseuse de Delft. The piece lasts just, uh, just over two minutes, if you don't play it too slowly. Um, 
it was uh, inspired by this lovely uh, uh, piece of sculpture, which is found next to the temple at Delphi. Uh, a copy of it was made and displayed in the Louvre in Paris. That's what inspired Debussy. And his prelude, I'd like us to hear it. It's an interesting structure, very overtly symmetrical, and I think he means us to hear that symmetry, um, symmetricality in it. It begins in B, B flat, um, moves up towards the dominant, and from the dominant to the dominant of the dominant, for the climax, right at exactly in the middle of the piece, and then through the dominant, back to the tonic, B flat again. And I think one of the reasons he wants us to hear it, at least in the back of our minds, is that the structure that the piece is painting comes out look, looking <coughs> rather like this. You'll notice that it is not literally symmetrical in every sense, because the last part is in three little divisions, but there are very clear pillars, and you see, counting by bars, there are symmetries, and counting by beats between the beginning and end, there are symmetries. What <coughs> so what I'll do is put on the, put on the music here, and... I'll, I have the nearest I can get to flying the aeroplane and the flight map is just to have little arrows showing us where we are in the piece as you hear it. I'm going to do this in a fair amount. I'm interested in the way this links up not only with the sculpture of ancient Greece, but with <clears throat> moves across the arts of Debussy's time. Debussy was a friend of the poet Malarmé, and uh, just after the preludes <clears throat> comes something interesting. I want to show you very quickly Soupir, one of the famous paintings by Malarmé. Again, another piece of symmetrical structure. It is in two stanzas. Uh, in a particularly interesting uh, sense of energy, and this has been known for a long time, all Mallory scholars are well aware of it, that the first stanza, all the energy is rising, mon âme vers ton front ou rêve au calme sœur, and fidèle un blanchet d'eau, a fountain, all upward energy, 
and Blanche d'eau soupire vers l'azur, and then the second stanza, all the energy is falling. Vers l'azur, attendri d'octobre, pâle et pur, it is the autumn. Se traîne at the end, se traîne le soleil jaune d'un long rayon. Debussy knew that poem very well. He knew Malarmé, and after he finished his piano preludes, of which you've just heard the first one, he set this to music. It's almost as if he is putting a little buckle and belt <coughs> around his preludes <coughs> with this. The structure of the poem really reflects that of the prelude. Debussy, of course, was spent more of his time with painters and writers than he did with musicians, or at least as <coughs> he did that as much as, as possible. Here is one of my focus, one of my, my double focus of interest today, the Schubert and a companion spirit <coughs> that might surprise us, but since we're in Vienna, we have to pay some attention to Schubert, and I love his music, and there's a lot more to Schubert than, than we think. I want to have a look now at his, <coughs> the second last of his, the three great sonatas um, that came right in the last months of his life, in 1828. This is the one in Ador, A major, and it has a most remarkable opening section. The, uh, the, the exposition of the first movement. It, is, it sounds like a regular sonata form. You may know how the sonata form works in music, that you have an exposition usually of two themes that are quite contrasted, and then the middle of the movement will develop them and make all sorts of puzzles with them and play with them like a game of football sometimes or an opera. And then the last part of the move movement will bring back the main themes but with less of the contrast. It usually brings them back in the same key instead of in different keys. Now, this exposition in Schubert seems too regular and symmetrical to be true. <clears throat> there is the first theme. Oh, I'll want that again. Okay. I'm just about to... I will be playing music. The first theme lasts, interestingly, for 27 bars. Now, from the first theme, Schubert, now this strikes me as unusual, there, but it is some standard in classical music. You have the first theme is exposed and usually played more than once with, with answers and new ideas. And then the music has to modulate. It, there's what's called a transition. In Schubert's case, it goes for another 27 bars. And then the second theme arrives. It looks amazingly regular and an ordinary exposition. In fact, if you are a police detective, you should be looking at this man very carefully. In fact, they did at that time. Um, he, was, he was very closely watched by Biedermeyer's police, it turns out. But not for musical reasons, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> the musical reasons interest me. The, the more you look at this, the more something is very strange about it. The first thing is, if you know Schubert's music, he doesn't normally spend long time um, moving from one key to the other. In his late works, like the quintet, he gives you the first subject in a key. When he wants a second subject, he, dro he drops to the new key for his second subject. He doesn't worry with transitions. Why does he have such a long transition here? The next thing is, what's the number of there? Um, oh yes, it's beautifully symmetrical. The second theme, it completes itself after 27 bars again. 3 times 27, that is 3 times 3 to the power 3, isn't it? Or 3 times 3 times 3 times 3. It's an extraordinary number. <clears throat> and also, the, the piece starts strongly. It, by the end of the exposition, it is, by the end of this exposition, it is dying away. And the loudest part in it, the, the absolute dramatic focus of it, comes halfway through a bar, sorry, halfway through um, bar 41, and it, the, the accented chord that marks this is actually in the half bar. So it, you, this strange number of 81 bars is divided so exactly. Now, we should be asking questions a bit. I would like you to hear the music, so I'm going to let it play now, and you'll see how clearly marked these transitions are. Did Schubert mean us to hear how symmetrical this was? I suspect, well, I can't prove anything about how consciously he composed all this, but I suspect that he did want us at least to intuit how symmetrical this was for reasons concerning what happens after it. Let me get the music going. And now, what I need 
to do is get it to, I think, to 14 minutes. ready. very strange is happening. At that point the second theme is completed and in any normal sonata exposition the music would tail away and you would have the repeat sign and you'd either go back to the beginning or you would move straight on into the middle of the, the middle of the movement, the development section. We have the choice of, we always have the choice of whether to repeat the exposition or not. And when you see Schubert's double bar saying you can go back or you can go on at this point, it could very easily come out of exactly this point where that ends, but it doesn't. Suddenly the music does something else, and what is it doing? Um, well, I'm interested in this. What happens here? First of all, the music then goes on for another almost 50 bars of completely new ideas, quite disruptive. At the end of it, it brings back the second subject. Um, <clears throat> So there are 81 bars of normal exhibition, uh, ex, sorry, exposition, that was a Freudian slip, I'm thinking of French exposition, but it's the same word, exposition of the main themes, and just as you expect the exposition to finish, it suddenly interrupts it and does something else for 50 bars, and brings back the second theme again. Um, <clears throat> did you notice I said 50 bars? I will let slip that where that interruption comes in fact forms is at the golden section of the longer, the complete exposition. But I don't want to talk too much about that today. This is not my business. That would be a different lecture. What interests me here is this. Because when you were listening to that music, did you have the impression that there were three bar phrases? I don't think so. Everything sounded like four bar phrases here. It's mostly 
bars in pairs. One and one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. It's all going like that. And just occasionally you have four bars and then he just, or six bars, and then he just tucks one in at the end so that he can get a total of 27. Or that's how the music happens. Four bar groups, again, just sometimes he extends, you have the four bar group completing itself and then there's just an extra bar tucked in. The second subject is very interesting. It starts with five bar groups. One, ta da 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 two, ta da da three. Four, four, one, five. So it is five bar phrases, but you have a four bar phrase plus one. And then gradually, as the music moves on, it tightens and goes in four bar phrases. But there, <clears throat> in this whole exposition, there is not a single three bar phrase. And yet, everything is multiples of three. So it's as if the music is trying not to make multiples of three, and yet, everything ends up being multiples of three. After the interruption comes, the numbers change and there are no longer multiples of three. But what the music that comes in at that point is all in three bar phrases for a long ostinato build up. The, this is full of irony, this structure. <clears throat> if, uh, if I were a composer doing this, I would be laughing because there, is a com there seems to me to be a compositional conceit, a kind of joke that is affecting the listener and is pulling at our musical responses as we listen to it. The three bar phrases are exactly where they are no use to the structure, except they're musically in the right place, and the, the 27 bar totals are exactly where they're most difficult to, to obtain by the music's phrases. So do, do you see the sort of irony that's going on there? It is a, it's an extraordinary structure, and the more one looks at this innocent sounding long sonata, the more puzzles there are. And one can understand also why this is an amazingly long movement and how he manages to hold our attention through such a long movement. Um, in, uh, just in case you wonder whether this is the only place, the middle of the movement does something else, the recapitulation does something else, and the numbers change a little bit. But at the very end of the movement, there is a coda of 27 bars divided 9 plus 9. I'll just see if I can find that for you. Um, it is it. Just get it here. Everything at the end answers and reciprocates what's the beginning. The beginning of at the end, answering it in the tonic from the dominant key to the tonic key. We can you can spend a lot of time with the sonata and have a lot of fun. Apart from that, if we don't notice what's going on, it is just a lovely piece of music to listen to. But the brain behind this is something rather special. Before, well, we don't know whether it was before, but together with this sonata, Schubert made this one of three huge big sonatas, the one that comes just before it, as in the order that he left them, is the sonata in C minor, uh, again in four movements. The finale interests me here. 
uh, <clears throat> it's the climax of the development section. I'm just going to find it here. Um, because at this point, we have something rather different. Um, <clears throat> this time, Schubert, again, as he did at the wrong place in the first movement of the other sonata, having gone in four bar phrases, he suddenly slams the music into a sequence, an ostinato sequence, for two pages of nothing but three bar phrases. And you feel as if the music has locked you into a kind of straitjacket, like a galloping horse, you're stuck on it, tied to it. Um, here's the rhythm, tum -ba -tum -ta -two, and a three, and a one, and a two, and a three, and a ta -ta 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 It's going there the whole time. It's, it goes on for a page before that, but the climax of the movement is this dominant pedal on G before the movement goes back to C. It's, you can see <laughs> the way the bars are organized, three plus three. It's always in pairs, one, two, three, two, two, three, one, two, three, two, two, three, and then one, two, three. Each of these six bar sequences starts with the G hammering out, um, and then it's interrupted, uh, first of all, by, sorry, I'll get that, it's interrupted by, there's the G interrupted by the A flat, the G is interrupted by F sharp, G again interrupted by A flat, and then the G, and the tension breaks at that point, and the, the climax of the movement starts to dissipate its energy. I'll just find that for you. Um, and I would just like to hear the energy of it quickly. Um, let me find the right place here. It is 25 minutes on the recording. interestingly, three, 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 and just as you reach the end of the climax there, the music relaxes into four bar phrases, and we relax with it, and we think, that's over. And then suddenly, you have that C sharp minor, or D flat minor chord, hits us in the ribs. He, his dramatic timing is magnificent. But what interests me here is I've just put up the way the, the rhythm is organized there. Now, let's see how these, that's we have six times that rhythmic pattern, one and one and two and three, and look at how the bars are organized there. One, two, three, two, two, three. So that whole passage is actually organized in this manner. To say each small phrase is organized in the same manner as the whole passage is. It's actually compound double augmentation, all in three bar phrases. You're beginning to see the relationship to the other sonata, but the complete, completely different way in which Schubert has done this. How many people notice this? I'm not sure. I listen to a lot of great recordings of this sonata, and when the three bar phrases start, Schubert marks a big accent and an interrupted cadence. Most pianists don't notice it and play it quietly. So I think many people don't notice it, but some do. Let us move to the next, <coughs> uh, next case. Back to Debussy. I'm just introducing him here. Here he is in the... Debussy, you may notice, likes to write in three-part cyclic forms, like La Mer. So this was him aged five years old in a three-part cyclic form. <laughs> he, also, he also... If you play, the pia play Debussy's piano music, you're aware of how important the thumbs are. He treats the keyboard like a pair of handlebars. Um, <clears throat> I think this is a very interesting one. Well, here he is, 40... 45 years later, and you notice that he has not done anything with his right hand in the meanwhile. <laughs> taken it out of one pocket into another. I'm pretty sure he must have been left-handed for all sorts of reasons, including musical ones. But let's have a look at 
his piano image, I made a map here of the second one, uh, Homage à Rameau, a beautifully um, uh, elegiac piece. The way it's organized, because some of the bars is mostly um, in 3-2 meter, but occasionally there's a bar that's longer or a bar that's shorter. In order, therefore, since the, meter, since the half note is very constant through the piece, I counted it in half notes. Um, so you'll recognize some of these numbers, but we're not going too far there with them. They just happen to be numbers that you may recognize. And anybody in biology and botany will recognize these. I'm interested in not just the symmetry but the, when the music comes back to rest at the tonic point in the middle of the piece, there you have a large symmetry <coughs> about it. Here it's 68 beats to the first climax of the music. It's 68 beats again from the middle of the piece to the focus, not to the start of the main climax, but to its, to its strongest focal point, and then 69 to the end. Bear in mind that this is in 3-2 meters, so that's 69 happens to be 23 regular bars. How do we get 68 then? It's because sometimes he makes a bar a different length. And in fact, these numbers would not be possible were, were it not for the changes in meter that Debussy has put into the piece. If he had kept it all in the same meter, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have the, the 21 is a very convenient one because that's seven bars of, of three to a meter. Let's have a listen to the music. I'd like you to hear what happens and how in this case, I don't think it, I don't think Debussy is trying to draw our attention to the geometry of the piece, except to this, except to the large scale symmetry in a most intuitive sense. I, I have a feeling that this, assuming that Debussy did it deliberately, I think we have to. But assuming so, I think this is intuitive, and Debussy wants it to sound intuitively right. Let me find the music here. Um, forgive me, I'll use that example to let you hear how clearly defined all these places are. But I want to move on from here, so you would have heard that had I had an hour's time today. Um, this is the second piece in his, his set of image, images, pictures, image. There's, it's already telling you about his interest in geometry and symmetry as, a, as an intuitive part of our auditory and visual experience. This piece, Homage à Rameau, is followed by one of his most um, abstract pieces, and this one really interests me, and I want you to see this and hear it, Mouvement. It's 100 and... Let me look at the number. It is 177 bars long, and when I made a map of it, I was surprised to find how symmetrical it looked, provided I counted not to the final bar, but to the last note, which is a staccato note in the bass. And it's counting to there that gives you this pattern. Now, the central section of it, where a new theme comes in and happens twice, you'll hear it happens the first time, and then the second time it comes back, it, it, it builds up over a bass F-sharp pedal, 
The C major is the key of the piece, so F sharp is it? Um, uh, it is the devil's interval of the tritone away from the tonic key of the piece. Debussy's tonal designs are always very clear. Um, and that middle section occupies 22 plus 22 bars, which happens to be exactly one quarter of the piece's length. Do you notice? Because the outer sections together make 100 and, um, uh, 632. Or, well, you've got, yes, 132. Altogether, if, if you take 44 and multiply it by 4, you get 176. Is that right? Or 4, yes, you do. I have counted correctly. So the middle section is exactly one quarter of the piece's length. Let us look at the opening section of the piece. It's the same pattern, but in miniature. There's a little symmetry of it. You'll hear this bass C, it's very characteristic. You'll hear the various things happen in here, but it's very well marked. There's an eight bar phrase, a bass C, eight bar phrase, and then the bass moves, and then it builds to a fortissimo before the central section starts. The recapitulation, the last part of the piece, has exactly the same proportions, but it's cu curiously, round there the music is different, and from here on the music is different as well. So, in fact, you would have expected the proportions to be different, because the music goes in entirely different ways, and yet it stays exactly within the same proportions. What else happens? The F sharp, the tum, the bass pedal, the bass that underpins that whole section, in fact starts four bars before the central section, and it continues for four bars up at the end of the central section. These four bars replace the opening four bars. Again, we have the symmetry of 62 bars in C major until, until the bass suddenly slams down to F sharp, stays there for 52 bars, and then from there, 62 bars again to the last note. And here, the first fortissimo in the piece is after 52 bars, leaving 62 plus 62. So they're very symmetrically defined Areas. This gets interesting to me. It's, it starts, it smacks to me more like something of Le Corbusier, Musier, who came after Debussy. But <clears throat> there are these areas of activity that are defined by that are defined by specific events in the music. This enormously interests me. So let me play this this piece here, um, and you'll hear how well that mark this is. Sorry. I'll just start that again. Sorry. Sorry, I didn't start it well. Let's do it again. Hear how abstract it is.
strange. Before we finish, I won't play any more music, but I'll show you one or two graphs of music. Bear in mind these numbers. Do you notice the, the importance of 88, the exact halfway point of the piece, 44, 44, the, the 44 in the middle, the 88 and the twice 88. This is 19.5. A very quick look at the Passacaglia in the middle of Ravel's piano trio, 19.14. Ravel didn't say explicitly, but if you make a map, ma you can hear it, and uh, Ravel, I'm sure, intends us to hear this at least intuitively. The piece is like a mirror. It is so symmetrical. It starts low on the piano, it ends low on the piano. It starts low, the, the, the left hand at the bottom of the piano, the cello joins it, then the violin joins it, then the three of them start to modulate and build up. To the middle of the piece, there's a crescendo to a first plateau of climax, then a crescendo, the first theme, a plateau right at the middle of it. You have the four, four bars. The two themes collide in counterpoint. One of them then fragments and decays, and gradually the movement dies away from that very powerful climactic middle section. Um, <clears throat> it reminds me of, this is a title page that Ravel drew for his Tombeau du Couperin. You just see his eye for beautiful symmetrical patterns. <laughs> I see something in that patterning, patterning that reminds, that makes me think of that. What have I done here? Yeah. Now I'm not going to, I'm not going to play the music, but I just want us to remember these numbers. Notice 88 bars and 44 at the middle, how it's, it's all divided. <clears throat> My final comment is, that one of the things years ago that prompted me to make maps of pieces and look at what happens where, of course, was the writings that, of Erno Lentfei that were first published in English, at least while I was a student. And I thought, it's an interesting way of looking at music, whatever one finds. Now, his classic case was the fugue from music for strings, percussion and cellista of Bartók. Um, <clears throat> He analysed that in terms of Fibonacci numbers, 34, 55, and 89. If you look closely, you'll notice that these are not the exact numbers. The shape is absolutely there. It is very, he's, he has spotted something that is very obvious. But counting very exactly, Bartok has slightly tweaked that shape so that, in fact, it's 33, not 34, 55, and 88. The piece ends after 88 bars. Um, and the fugue, the fugal progression going through it, which moves from one note to another, goes through the entire cycle of fifths, reaches halfway through the cycle of fifths from A to D sharp after 44 bars. So in that fugue we have 33 bars, 44 bars, 55 bars, 77 bars and 88 bars with groups of 22 and 33. Bartok knew Debussy's and Ravel's music very well and when I see these numbers I'm thinking of this. 88, you know, 88 bar fugue of, of Bartok's. I'm thinking of this Passacaglia, a piece that Bartok certainly played, and I'm thinking also of this image of Debussy. Particularly important because when Kodai came to Paris in 1905, he went back to Budapest with scores for Bartok and for himself, and one of the scores he went back with was this one of Debussy's image. I must stop there, you may want to ask questions. But I wanted to have a look at some of these obvious and less obvious symmetries and consider, hear them, and consider how much the composer is pulling the wool over our eyes and how much the composer is sometimes saying open them. There are 
there are different, I think the composers are doing different things at different times. They are playing with us like they play on their instruments. <clears throat> I'll hand it over to you for questions now. Thank you very much. was very interesting and convincing, but I think uh, uh, these remarkable proportions and symmetries are, aren't possible for the listener to, to notice, to, to consciously uh, uh, be aware of while yes. listening. So what do you think these proportions bring to the listener while he's listening to the music, while, while he's enjoying the music? Uh, there's, we could spend hours on this. It is yes. fascinating. First of all, the we will not hear these proportions are not going to mean much to us until you reach to the, the end of the piece because it is only that then that they complete themselves and it is not like a picture where you look at the entirety with one sweep of the eye. Um, <clears throat> it, there, there's a big question. Sometimes people argue, the com <clears throat> many people are surprised to see this in Debussy or Schubert and say, oh, he would not have done this deliberately. It must have happened intuitively. So the answer to that is, well, if it happened too intuit intuitively, then it proves that it is something intuitive. And if it's intuitive for the composer, presumably it is intuitive for the listener. Alternatively, if the composer did it deliberately, then we might not hear it. But we might not hear it as such, but why did the composer do it? I think what, what we are not going to hear 25 and think as we're listening to the piece, who wants to hear 25 bars, 33 bars? <laughs> I think these, in a way, are composer conceits, but there is something compositionally aesthetic there, that the composer wants something to sound exactly in place. Mozart put it well once. He said, connoisseurs will notice that something is going on here. Those who are less connoisseurs will enjoy the music without realizing why it's sounding right. So I think the composer's aim, in most of these cases, is, for us, is to reach more the back of our minds rather than the front of our minds. So in, in Danseuse de Delft, the first one, Debussy is just, I think, wanting to implant, give us an impression of a symmetrical shape. We don't need to know exactly what the numbers are. And again in this one, this one gets more interesting. I think Debussy is saying, if you are really curious, have a look inside this piece. Make a map of it and have a look. He didn't tell anybody about this, but these numbers are interesting. Again, because when you have 8 and 16, the music is very irregular and we relax to it. When you get different numbers in 3s and 5s, it makes us sit up. So these different groupings of bars affect the way we listen, but we're not conscious of it's happening. I think a composer is playing in a subconsciously. Does that make sense? On our subconscious? Yes, of course, but it's, it's an infinite matter. Oh, of course. <laughs> this, this could go on all week, <laughs> and I would love it. Yes, yes please. Uh, you chose very convincing examples of uh, ABC and Schubert. Uh, it's very interesting, but it uh, seems to me that you find uh, very symmetrical uh, forms in, in, in Bruckner and Cooper and in almost everywhere. But I made a comment the other day uh, that I hadn't really thought about. But, uh, but it seemed to me that the composer who who's most concerned with symmetry in uh, uh, Western classical music was Mozart. What do you think about that? Yes, in a sense. Um, <clears throat> it, sounds it sounds symmetrical. And he plays on symmetry. What to, the thing to do is make a map of anything by Mozart and see what the totals are, what happens where. One of the things Mozart does most often is give you an eight-bar phrase, or it'll be four plus four, um, and sometimes he'll work that out exactly like that. Then he'll go on, and most often Mozart will, at some point when he wants to compress the action, he will make a four-bar phrase and four-bar phrase, an eight-bar group, and as you get to the eighth bar, he will elide it with a new phrase, so that if you're counting it, you get a seven bar phrase, and yet you can hear the eighth bar phrase completing itself in the same bar as a new one starts off with. So the symmetry becomes more hidden and elided. If you make a map of it, it will look asymmetrical, but if you look what, what's happening inside, it is very symmetrical. We could spend a week looking at that. He's, <laughs> nobody, nobody is more... Um, craft conscious than Mozart in the, in the whole history of music, of course, except, well, along with Bach and a few others. With Bruckner, <laughs> there are many. Bruckner is an interesting case. 
<clears throat> I don't know if anybody has got to the bottom of his interest in numbers. You know that he had numeromania. Oh, yeah. The, you, you know all about that. He had to count everything. So I'm sure he counted his bars. There are <clears throat> two things. The, the symmetry in his, the way four bar phrases or six bar phrases or whatever they are, are echoed and balanced is so overt that he wants us to hear that symmetry. I would like to make maps and see whether the small scale symmetries that we hear are matched by large scale symmetries. It is difficult because there are so many versions of most of his, uh, of his symphonies and the proportions change because passages are added, cut, repetitions are taken in and taken out. So what, uh, what are we going to find in which version of Bruckner? But the symmetry is very overtly on the surface there. I love his music, incidentally. It's, <clears throat> there's a fascination there. The ways in, I'm interested the, 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 in where, and I chose the examples today from music where, unlike Bruckner, the composer is not hitting us in the chin with the symmetry. Where you're thinking, hmm, you have to look closely to find the symmetry. And then you think, yes, he, the composer is sending us a signal about that, but not most obviously, not, not where Bruckner is putting it up right in front of our eyes. And Mozart makes you think, oh yes, this is symmetrical, but no, it isn't. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you. Yes, I have only one question. It was, um, uh, at the very beginning, you gave an example from Debussy. Uh, and uh, I think it was an interpretation of a Greek statue, was it? Uh, well, a sort of musical counterpart to it, yes. Yes, yes. and you had a diagram. And, uh, and was that the consciously constructed as a Greek temple facade? Well, I can't tell you, because Debussy didn't say to anybody. That's how, this, that's how the piece ended up. Whether he did that deliberately or whether it happened intuitively, I don't know. I think because of things like this and what we see in the in the case, you know, in Omar Shazamo, and also um, if you want to, if you really feel like a long read, in this book there's a lot more about it. There's Omar Shazamo. The piece before that, the Rufle Ronlo, is entirely organised by Fibonacci numbers with a lot of symmetries, but mostly using the golden section properties of Fibonacci numbers. Um, could that all have happened without him designing it? There's nothing as completely impossible in science uh, and in creation, but I suspect he must have known something because he was surrounded by people who knew about that. But it's an open question. And if, and, you know, if he didn't know, then, then something very strong is acting on him, and I think acting on us. It's very short. Very, very short. Yeah. Who was the pianist? Uh, oh, Guilty Millard. It was. It was uh, most. There were mostly ones I had done. Some of them were from CDs. The, the, the Debussy was from a, from one of my re CD recordings. The Schubert were from concerts I played. Thank you very much. We can continue to discuss this very interesting lecture in private conversations. And now we are transferring to our session music and symmetry with a very small break, only five minutes. Thank you very much.